Thank you everybody for joining us for our educator webinar series on back to school asthma and COVID. Um, welcome to all of our teachers, educators, school administrators. Um, we're really happy to have you here today and looking forward to um, doing this presentation for you and allowing you some time to ask um, any questions that you may have related to the presentation or questions that you may have um, surrounding back to school and asthma and COVID. Um, just to let you know, um, the Lung Health Foundation, a bit about us. Uh, we are dedicated to ending gaps in the prevention, diagnosis, and care of lung disease in Canada. We invest in the future by driving groundbreaking research and we give patients and their families the programs and support that they need today. My name is Jennifer Noble. I'm the Senior Manager of Member Engagement here at the Lung Health Foundation. And with me today is Diane Feldman and Sarah Hahn. They are two of our respiratory educators at the Lung Health Foundation. I'm just gonna let you know a little bit more about them in greater detail. Diane has worked as a registered respiratory therapist and certified respiratory educator for the Lung Health Foundation for more than 20 years. Prior to that, she worked as a registered respiratory therapist in an acute care hospital. Her specific interest is in asthma and COPD management, as well as other lung diseases, smoking cessation, and air quality. Sarah Hahn works at the Lung Health Foundation's primary care asthma program as the provincial coordinator, where she plays a role in implementing an evidence-based asthma and COPD program throughout primary care in Ontario. As a registered respiratory therapist and certified respiratory educator, she has experience working in the hospital and primary care settings in Ontario. She is also a teach train smoking cessation counselor. She has served on the Health Quality Ontario expert panels for COPD and has also facilitated a Delphi panel for the development of national COPD quality indicators. Thank you so much ladies for being here today. And uh, I'll let you all know that you're in very good hands with these two ladies. They're super knowledgeable and um, eager to answer any of your questions after the presentation. Uh, please, Know that you can put any of your questions, anything you'd like to ask or discuss with um, our respiratory educators today in the Q&A section at the bottom, and we will begin answering questions at the end of the presentation. I'm gonna hand things over to the ladies now. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. We are excited to have you today. It's been an interesting year to say the least, and we are here today to answer any questions you may have regarding navigating asthma this school year. Some of you may want to know how best you can support your student with asthma. Some of you may have kids with asthma going to school, and some of you may have asthma yourself. During this presentation, we will guide you on key points and tips to help you navigate asthma and have an asthma safe learning environment. We all know with COVID-19, policies and evidence have been changing so rapidly. What we present today is based on the best available evidence from the Canadian Thoracic Society, the Ministry of Health, and Ministry of Education documents to date. Next slide. So what we will be going through today are uh, some asthma basics. So what is asthma? What are common symptoms, triggers, medications and what an action plan looks like. We'll go through Ryan's Law or ensuring asthma friendly schools. Diane will be talking about managing asthma attacks, what the September spike is and asthma safe learning tips during COVID-19. Next slide. So what is asthma? So asthma is a chronic, chronic meaning uh, you always have it. It's not acute, you don't just get it and then it goes away. Chronic means you always have it once you're diagnosed. So it's a chronic inflammatory condition in the airways of the lungs. Asthma causes the airways in the lungs to be more sensitive and twitchy, reacting to things in the environment called asthma triggers. So as you can see in the picture on the left side, you can see a nice open airway. So you can see the dark pink bands around the airway are nice and open and relaxed. Inside the airway, you can see it's nice and open, there's, it's not swollen, there's no mucus, and air can go in and out very easily. So that's what a normal airway looks like or an asthma, a person with asthma who's very well controlled. The picture on the right is when um, a person's asthma is uncontrolled or they're going through an asthma flare-up. 
So as you can see, those pink bands that were nice and relaxed before is actually tightening and it's strangling the airway so that it's making it even harder to breathe. Inside of the airway, you can see it's swollen now with um, mucus that's inside. So you can see that hole that was really big and air goes in easily in and out. Now you're basically breathing through a straw and that's why it's so difficult to breathe. And the most common, or the most, the common symptoms of asthma are wheezing, that whistling or harmonica sound in your chest, difficulty breathing or shortness of breath is uh, the term that we call it, coughing and chest tightness. Next slide. So asthma triggers are divided into allergens and irritants. So common allergens are dust or dust mites, pollen, mold, pets, animal dander. Food allergies is not so common, but we've left it here because there are some cases where food allergies can also coincide with asthma triggers. Next slide. Other tr triggers include irritants. So those are viral infections such as cold, flu, and COVID-19. So some people um, have, have this myth that um, a person with asthma or any other lung condition um, are more at risk of getting COVID-19, um, but that's actually not true. However, um, a person living with asthma or lung disease, um, if they actually contract or get COVID-19, their symptoms can actually look much worse or be worse. And so we just have to be aware of that. And um, the key message that Diane and I will talk throughout this presentation is to maintain asthma control. Um, other irritant triggers are smoking or exposure to smoke. Exercise can be an asthma trigger. Air pollution or air quality. Weather changes such as extremely hot and humid weather or extremely cold weather. Strong odors such as perfumes, cleaning products, markers, paint, glue chalk dust, and building repairs. So this year, um, there's gonna be more cleaning protocols, more chemicals and cleaning products that are used. And so um, you just have to be more aware um, of a room being cleaned and ensuring that the person living with asthma does not go into the room right away. Um, so wait for a period um, to let the fumes subside. Um, and then also well ventilate the area as well, opening windows, um, making sure the ventilation system is going um, so that you prevent um, an asthma flare-up or an asthma exacerbation um, with cleaning products. Everyone's triggers are different, so you just have to be aware of what your triggers are. Um, and um, that is all, all a part of maintaining asthma control. Next slide. So exercise, like I said, can be an asthma trigger. And this is important because kids will be in recess and um, they'll be going to gym class. Um, asthma should not inhibit exercise at all. Um, if, if it does inhibit it, that means your asthma is not controlled. So there are some tips and tools that you can use in order to um, have a good exercise. There are Olympic athletes who have asthma, actually severe asthma, and still um, participate in those extreme sports. And so um, it is really something that can be achievable. So warm up 10 to 15 minutes prior to exercise and cool down after. Some people may need to use a reliever inhaler or blue inhaler 10 to 15 minutes prior to the exercise. Uh, monitor the outdoor conditions. So if your triggers are extremely hot and cold weather or air pollution or air quality, or if it's ragweed season and you know that it's, your trigger is ragweed, then uh, you should probably not be exercising outdoors. Um, you should probably exercise indoors. There's um, these two really great websites, um, airhealth.ca and weather.ca. You can check the air quality, um, we call it the air quality health index. You can check the air quality levels every single day. Uh, we're lucky in Ontario because we actually have this measurement um, for every region, um, every uh, township. And so if you go under there, you can find what your air quality level is. If it's on the low end, so on a scale of one to 10, if it's on the low end, that means it's good air quality. If it's on the higher end, that means it's poor. So you should, probably should be avoiding outdoor activities. Um, so next slide. <clears throat> so Ryan's law or ensuring asthma friendly schools when it was enacted in 2015. The law outlines school board responsibilities to provide a safe school environment for students with asthma. So it all started with a boy named Ryan Gibbons, who was a boy who lived in Ontario, died in 2012 at school 
after having an asthma attack um, during recess. So what happened was that um, Ryan actually um, had his inhaler or his reliever inhaler locked up in a cabinet inside the school while he was um, in recess. And um, while they were, he was having an asthma attack, the teachers were trying to get the asthma medication and it was too late. And so this law, along with other, sorry, uh, this law allows um, a, a student uh, to carry their own asthma rel reliever at school with them um, and also ensures that other measures are taken into ensure an asthma friendly um, school environment. Next, next page. So in terms of asthma medication, these are probably the medications that you'll be seeing um, inside the, uh, the schools. And so these reliever inhalers, or they're oftentimes blue. Um, there is an exception. Kids who are 12 and over may be using that white and red inhaler that you see at the bottom of the screen. Um, so that is um, a controller medication, but it can actually be used as a reliever inhaler as well. So reliever inhalers are usually only taken when needed or before exercise for quick relief. So it acts really quickly, so in five minutes, and then um, it's supposed to last about two to three hours, but you get that the highest, I guess, efficacy um, in that initial 20, five to 20 minutes. And so that's why they're called relievers. Individuals should have easy access to their reliever inhaler when needed. Um, so ensure that the um, student not only has it with them, but carries it around with them whenever they're going from the classroom to recess to the lunchroom. Um, so just ensure that it's always there. Um, inhaler medicines also should not be shared among students and um, among teachers and students as well. Next slide. These are controllers or preventers. So these are medications that we use, uh, we take on a daily basis, usually twice a day. Um, so you'll see it often, or the child will take it pre probably before school and then after school. Um, so these are medications that um, maintain asthma control. And so just like um, a person who lives with high blood pressure, they take blood pr pressure medication every single day. Um, so even though they may not have high pl blood pressure that day, they still take it so that they maintain that blood pressure level. Um, and so these are exactly this, it's the same concept where it maintains the control level um, so that um, if we are exposed to our asthma triggers, you know, um, unknowingly, um, the asthma medication is in your system um, already working. Um, and um, it says, unless the student will be participating in an overnight activity, which probably won't be the case this year. Next slide. So proper inhaler technique is key. Medications are only good as the technique used. We have um, curated excellent um, videos um, on our website, so lunghealth.ca slash inhalers. And um, there's um, the proper inhaler technique for every device that's out there. And so please go on that website, please direct the students to go on that website um, so that you all know um, the proper inhaler technique before school starts so that you're aware of how, how to take it. Um, the reliever inhalers, usually they're the spray, um, spray um, inhalers that you've probably seen with the canisters. Um, they, they should be taken with a spacer, um, ideally, and a spacer looks like the one in the picture and Diane will show you in, in her screen. Um, so a spacer and an MDI should go hand in hand. Um, so you put it on one hand, the mouthpiece is on the other, uh, you spray it and you take a one deep breath in, you count 10 seconds and you breathe out. So that's one dose. Um, and so it's, it's really important that um, um, the, the, the spacer is used in all age groups and for kids who are usually five and over, um, they should be taking the spacer without the mask because ideally if a child is able to put their mouth around um, a mouthpiece without a leak, then they should probably do that without having a mask in place. Uh, next slide. So I'll just briefly show you here. This is what a, a pediatric action plan looks like. So this is for um, kids who are one to 15 years old. And these are oftentimes used at home. This is between the provider, their primary care provider, their physician or nurse practitioner and uh, the patient. Um, and they would be keeping this um, you know, in a well um, visible place at home. 
Um, this is a green um, traffic light system. So green means good, yellow means caution, and um, red means it's an emergency. And so um, you see in this green zone, there's certain criteria that um, outlines what a control looks like. So use of reliever puffer no, no more than three times per week, daytime symptoms, so cough, wheeze, shortness of breath, uh, chest tightness, no more than three times per week. Ability to do physical activities is not limited, no nighttime symptoms, and they're not missing um, school um, or regular activities, and no symptoms of a cold. So when there's any deviation from any one of these criteria, that means the asthma is not controlled and they should probably see their healthcare provider in order to either um, get more education on how to avoid triggers or um, how to take their medication better, or maybe they need to increase their medication. Um, and so um, the whole idea is for us to always maintain and be in that green zone. Ideally, we, will, we don't wanna be in that red zone where you're in an emergency situation and Diane will talk more about that in terms of an asthma attack. Um, but generally, we wanna be in that green zone. Um, I'm not gonna to talk too much about this, so I'm gonna show you just in the next slide. This is probably what you're gonna see. So this plan um, is from the Ministry of Education. It's a plan of care for asthma. So the ministry has provided direction to school boards to have policies and procedures in place to support children and students with certain medical conditions in schools. The policy known as PPM 161, supporting children and students with prevalent medical conditions, such as anaphylaxis, asthma, diabetes, and or epilepsy in schools. Um, and this has been implemented in schools since the fall of 2018. So uh, the student who has asthma or any one of these conditions should have one in place um, in their um, school files. And if they don't, you can download it on this website shown. You could print one out and then um, you can fill it out with a parent and the, and the school administration. So it's really important that all children with asthma have, one of, have this um, asthma plan of care. Um, and um, all of the children's caregivers, their teachers, their teacher's assistants, they're all aware of what the plan is for that child. Um, next slide. So I have this here um, because um, I just wanna show you that even for teachers and parents who are in the audience today, um, that there is one for adults um, to use. Um, it's exactly the same traffic light system. Um, and pretty much the exactly the same control criteria. So if you do have asthma, um, then you should um, have one in place and have one in place um, um, in, in agreement with your healthcare provider. So I will just hand it over to my colleague, Diane, um, to um, talk about asthma attacks. Thank you, Sarah. Fantastic. So. What to do in the event of an asthma attack? And we have this poster um, that you can download from our website, which is lunghealth.ca. Um, lung and I'm gonna take you through the different sections that we have um, highlighted on this, this uh, poster so that you understand in more detail of what should be done. So anytime you're worried that somebody is having an asthma attack, they can't participate in sports, they have to sit out and so on, these are the steps that can be taken. So number one, take action. So if any of the following occur, any kind of continuous coughing, difficulty breathing, chest tightness or wheezing, which is a whistling sound in the chest, the person may also be restless, irritable and or tired, use the fast acting reliever, which is usually blue, and use a spacer as provided. Now, Sarah was talking before about the types of inhalers and when we're talking about the air chamber being used, we're talking about it being used with this type of device. This is called a meter dose inhaler. And most of the time, most, most people are using something like this. It could be salbutamol, it could be Ventolin. This is, it's in the form of a meter dose inhaler and we call it an MDI. And the meter dose inhaler should be used with a spacer because too often people using an MDI by itself, they really don't get the, uh, the effect properly. If the medicine doesn't end up in your lungs, it's not gonna help. So even if you say you're on a medication and this type of uh, MDI, if it's not reaching your lungs, it's not gonna help. So the air chamber helps to put distance between 
the puffer and the breathing so that more of the medication can actually be deposited in your lungs. So that's a little side discussion about MDI and, and aero chamber. So step one, immediately use a fast acting reliever inhaler, usually blue and use a spacer if provided. Step two, check symptoms and only return to normal activity when all symptoms are gone. So if symptoms get worse or do not improve within 10 minutes, this is an asthma emergency and follow the steps. Next slide. So an asthma emergency. So breathing is very difficult and fast. Uh, people cannot speak in full sentences. Lips or nail beds are blue or gray. Skin on the neck or chest gets sucked in with each breath. So normally you wouldn't even see the neck muscles in use when somebody is not in uh, distress. But if somebody can't breathe, you may see that the neck muscles are being, or the skin on the neck is being sucked in. So skin on the neck or chest is sucked in with each breath. Person may also be anxious, restless, and or tired. So again, step one, immediately use a fast acting reliever, usually blue, use a spacer if provided. Call 911 for an ambulance and follow 911 communication protocol for emergency responders. Step two, if symptoms continue, use the reliever inhaler, usually blue, every five to 15 minutes until medical help arrives. While waiting for medical help, have the student sit with arms resting on the table and do not have the student lie down unless it is an anaphylactic reaction. So just on a side note again about anaphylaxis, you may have students in your class who have both anaphylaxis and asthma. Anaphylaxis actually is, happens in the upper airway in the windpipe, whereas asthma is the lower branches of the lungs in the bronchi and the bronchioles. That's where asthma happens. But what happens is if you, ha if you have a student in your class who has anaphylaxis and asthma and you're not sure which one it is, err on the side of caution and use the EpiPen and call 911. Always follow up with a 911 call. If somebody has had an anaphylactic reaction, they need to be seen again in eMERGE because they have the big risk is that a rebound effect and they need another dose of epinephrine later on. So if you're not sure if it's asthma or anaphylaxis, give epi, epinephrine. Do not have the student breathe into a bag. Stay calm, reassure the student, stay by his or her side. Notify parent, guardian, or emergency contact. It is important to notify the parent, guardian, that an asthma attack occurred so that they can monitor the asthma at home and follow up with their healthcare provider. So again, just in general terms, if you're seeing that there's a child in your class who has a lot of difficulty with asthma management, it may not be an acute attack at this point, but they may, you may identify them as being in the yellow zone according to the action plan that, uh, that Sarah was describing. The parents should be notified and you know, they can work with the healthcare provider to try better manage that child's asthma. So here we go with the September spike. So typically, typically in a typical year, the third week of September is known as a September spike. So kids are returning to school. It can mean more emergency visits for children due to asthma flare-ups. And so this is the September spike. So why? The main reasons for the September spike is that perhaps asthma management routines were not followed during the summer. They weren't taking their controller medication on a regular basis, they felt fine, and that led to poor asthma control in the fall. The other thing is that we're getting started with exposure to other kids, we're starting with activities and so on. So we're trading respiratory viruses again. So kids are in close proximity to each other. They may be more exposed to respiratory viruses, and they may also be stimulated by allergens such as ragweed cold air and other triggers. So that is the usual reason for a September spike. It'll be interesting to see what happens this year because of COVID-19 precautions as to whether or not this is actually going to be a reality. And also, I think also depending on when the school year is actually gonna be starting um, this fall. 
So say asthma safe learning during COVID-19. Always number one is social physical distancing of at least two meters or six feet as much as possible. Wear a face mask and uh, practice respiratory hygiene. So cover your cough. So step one, cover your mouth and nose when you cough, sneeze, or blow your nose. Step two, put the used tissue in the garbage. Step three, if you, have, uh, if you don't have a tissue, cough or sneeze into your sleeve, not in your arm, so into the uh, crook of your elbow. Number four, clean your hands with soap and water or hand sanitizer, at least 70% alcohol-based. Now, hand washing with soap and water is by and large the most effective way to manage germs if in the absence of that, um, promoting hand sanitizer would promote hand sanitizer. So it may be a reality in the school where you know, you're in the classroom and it's not easy access to soap and water. Always cover your cough. Covering your cough or sneeze can stop the spread of germs. If you don't have a tissue, cough or sneeze into your sleeve. Keep your distance more than two meters or six feet from people who are coughing or sneezing. So masks, oh, we have so many questions about people, you know, and, and uh, having to wear masks and the requirement for masks. Masks are not a replacement for social distancing, hand washing, proper ventilation. Do not touch the mask except the ear loops. So I have an example of one that the Lung Health Foundation is selling. And you want to make sure that you're only touching the sides, the ear loops, when you're putting it on and taking it off. Um, so there, is, there are slides on how to put one on and take one off. For the interest of time, we haven't put that in here. But you can Google you know, proper donning and doffing of, um, of masks. Wash and sanitize hands before and after handling the mask. Replace the mask if dirty or damp. And when not using the mask, store in clean, reuse, resealable bag. A child should have spare masks for when mask is dirty or wet or drops on the floor. Masks should not be shared. So, you know, small children like to trade all kinds of things. So really try to discourage them from trading their masks. You know, that one might think that the pattern on their mask is nicer and they want, yeah, yeah nicer than somebody else's or so on. So does asthma exempt you from wearing a mask? Ministry of Education states, reasonable exceptions to the requirement to wear masks are expected to be put in place by schools and school boards. Staff or students with sensory or breathing difficulties may be exempted by the school principal guided by school board policy. So by and large, it doesn't necessarily include asthma. We've said before, if asthma is under control, people with asthma should be able to wear a mask. There's no current data that shows that people with lung conditions cannot wear a mask. So if somebody is having difficulty wearing a mask, they really maintain that they can't wear a mask. If a child has asthma, then maybe we look at whether or not there's a way to better manage their asthma so that they can wear a mask more easily, or maybe offer them alternative ways of learning. So a good cloth mask or face covering should be uh, made of two plus layers of woven fabric, such as cotton or linen. It should fit tightly to the head with ties or ear loops. It should be easy breathing, comfortable, not require adjusting, not pulling it down below your nose or putting it down be below your chin because there's so much handling going on already that it defeats the purpose of wearing a mask. Maintain its shape after washing and drying and be large enough to cover the nose and mouth without gaping. Hand washing. So wash, sanitize hands often before or after handling the mask, entering and exiting the school, after coughing and sneezing, after being in public, before and after using the washroom, before and after eating, before, uh, be, uh, before and after preparing food, and when hands are dirty. Follow your school policies with regards to symptom management and staying home. So if you feel 
you know, in the morning that you have some issues or the child has some issues with possible COVID symptoms, they should be um, requested to stay home and manage those symptoms. Reduce exposure to your triggers, such as viral infections, allergens, cleaning products, smoke or vape. The Lung Health Foundation has a plethora of um, resources, really. So these are some links that we wanted to share with you here. This asthma safe learning is lunghealth.ca backslash back to school. And inhaler videos, we said before, inhaler video, inhalers and the medication in the inhalers are only as good as your technique. And so if that medica medication is not reaching the lungs, it's not going to be effective. So inhaler videos, lunghealth.ca backslash how to use an inhaler. And just on a side note, we have some superstars who were demonstrating those masks and, and Sarah's children are part of that <laughs> as well. So that's just a sidebar. We use our own staff and, and talent to create those videos. Uh, the 1-800 number is 1-888-344-5864. You can reach us through email at info at lunghealth.ca and you can reach us through lunghealth.ca, we have a chat line as well. Thank you. Sorry, Diane, um, just going back to the website. Um, so lunghealth.ca slash back to school. So that's where you can find all of the material that we showed you on the slides today, such as the asthma tax poster. Um, I'm gonna see if I can share my screen here. Um, let's see. Okay, so I'm gonna try to share my screen. Sorry, guys. Don't stop sharing then. So you can see on my screen here. So this is the website. So as you can see, it has um, all of our key messaging. Um, there's our asthma control check here. Um, so this is um, content on September spike. There's the pediatric action plan, which you can download. Um, we also have tips and um, what should be in the child's backpack. So there's some extra ones that um, we didn't mention today. And then these are asthma resources. So asthma safe protocols for parents, for teachers, um, managing asthma tax posters. So you can all download that in some children's books here. So I just wanted to show that that's available. So I would encourage everyone to, to have a look at this afterwards. Thank you so much, ladies, Diane and Sarah. And thanks, Sarah, for taking us through that extra portion of the website where all of those resources can be found. Um, we're going to uh, start our question and answer period now. So uh, we know you have a lot of questions regarding uh, back to school and asthma and COVID. So please feel free to add any questions you have in the Q&A area and we'll get to them. Um, our first question. Um, asthma versus COVID and the symptoms, how can I tell the difference in my pupils? So that's a very good question. And if you see, so first of all, there should be screening, uh, screening protocols in the morning. When the child is coming into school, there, there should be a screening protocol about, um, you know, their history of whether or not they have fever, if they have any shortness of breath, if they have cough and so on to find out whether or not they are at risk for coming into the school. Asthma is, there are some common crossovers with asthma and, and COVID such as shortness of breath. By and large, the shortness of breath for asthma um, may be a little bit, the level of shortness of breath may be a little bit different than COVID. The other thing is that the onset of symptoms for COVID, it usually takes two weeks to actually develop COVID. You don't really know who has COVID for, um, for the first two weeks and so on after exposure. Um, asthma should be a little bit more acute. And in any case, the treatment or what you do is probably the same thing. Because if you see somebody struggling with a breath, you know they have asthma, you can first question them, you know, whether or not they're having difficulty breathing, if they want to try using their rescue inhaler to see whether or not that helps to calm, calm them down and, and takes away that, that feeling of shortness of breath. 
notify parents. And if you're still not certain, if you still are worried that it may be COVID-19, then maybe, you know, the child should be picked up and taken home. And the other um, sort of difference um, with COVID-19 is that COVID-19 is oftentimes um, associated with fevers, um, which that is not necessarily associated with asthma flare-ups or um, asthma symptoms. And so that's another um, distinguishing characteristic that you can look out for. Thanks, ladies. Our next question, um, my child has asthma. Um, does he or she need to wear a mask to school? So the, the message again is asthma control. And we said before that if asthma is under control, there should be no difficulty with wearing a mask. So either if the, you know, perhaps then the child's asthma is not as well controlled as it could be, we can take a look at measures to try and improve the management of asthma in terms of, you know, staying away from triggers. And often, it's just even the understanding that the controller medication needs to be on board regularly, that, you know, regular use of that anti-inflammatory drug is very important in managing asthma because, again, it doesn't have, you don't have that protective factor. If um, just because you're feeling well doesn't mean you're not susceptible to um, a problem. So using the controller on a medication on a regular basis should afford better control. Um, so, Yes, you know, in theory, a child should be able to wear a mask. If the child is still having difficulty with the mask, then perhaps, you know, then the school, the school board needs to look at alternate ways of, of um, providing them with some, maybe some online learning opportunities from home. Sarah, do you have anything else? No, you said it very well. Yeah, it should be a case-by-case -case basis. So just like the slide that Diane showed um, in terms of the current ministry policies, uh, reasonable exceptions can be made. Um, and this is guided by school board policies as well as um, school, like the actual school itself. And so work with your school, work with your healthcare provider um, to see um, if um, a mask is right for you. And if not, then um, there, there's, there should be more discussion as to what the alternative methods of, of learning is. Great answers, ladies. Thank you. What about face shields and alternative face coverings? Great question again. Uh, so there's currently no evidence that face shield is more or is um, shows the same efficacy or protection um, as a mask does. Um, and so, um, I mean, so right now the evidence shows that wearing a face shield alone is not as good as wearing a mask. Ideally, you would wear a mask, um, but this is something that you also have to um, uh, talk about with your schools um, and your healthcare provider to see if that is, um, uh, that is an exception or that is an alternate uh, method for you. Thanks, Sarah. If a student forgets their asthma inhaler, what should I do? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question and that can theoretically come up for sure. Um, if, if a teacher knows that a child has a history of asthma, maybe you know, check with the parent in the morning to make sure that the asthma inhaler, the emergency inhaler is available, you know, in their backpack or somewhere that it's readily accessible. Asthma medication is medication and it should not be shared. So in the event that you don't know where the inhaler is or there isn't one, then you're, you're forced to call 911 at that point. Thanks, Diane. Um, are there other times of the year that we may see spikes in asthma other than the September spike? So there's what's called this is December spike. And that's um, scientifically there, it's, it's true. There's that September spike and then there's that December spike. Usually it coincides with the holidays. So when the families and friends start to get together and celebrate the holidays and people are mixing, 
So that probably won't kind of pan out this year. And September spike is also going to look very different this year, not only because school is starting later this year, but also we're taking all these measures. And, you know, sci scientists are still trying to figure out whether the flu season is going to look the same this year as well. Um, if more people get the flu vaccine or, you know, um, will it be a lot less because we're taking all these measures of um, hand hygiene and wearing masks and physical distancing. So it'd be really interesting to see this year, but usually it's that September and December spike that we see. Thanks, Sarah. Um, will putting a mask back on after using a rescue inhaler uh, decrease the benefits of the inhaler use? Should It should not. If you've taken your inhaler properly and the medication is now in your lungs, uh, it has nothing to do with the mask that you're wearing at that point. So it should not decrease the efficacy of using the medication. Thanks, Diane. So we still have a bit of time left here for any other questions, if anyone would like to add them um, in the Q&A section below. And also, if you do have any questions in the future, or if any of um, the parents of your students have questions, anyone that you work with has questions, uh, our lung line uh, is available as well. And you can also send your questions to info at lunghealth.ca. And uh, someone will definitely get back to you and guide you through anything that you may have remaining as far as questions go on um, asthma and back to school and um, this sort of new territory that everybody is going to be entering in in a couple of days. So just give it a couple more minutes and see if there are any other questions that come through. Just to make a little comment about, you know, encouraging people to get the flu shot. The flu shot is a very effective way of reducing your uh, chance of developing the flu. And it also creates herd immunity, which means that if you have the flu, then you're protecting other people around you from getting the flu as well. And uh, it is available for children, I believe, six months and older. And so it's, it's an important thing. It is a safe vaccine. I believe we will be doing some webinars and some videos on uh, flu shots as well coming up, maybe later in September, October. Thanks, Diane. Yes, everyone stay tuned for those. I'll have more information on that to come. While we're waiting some questions to come in, I'd also like to mention that um, not only the issue of a student not bringing their inhalers to school, but um, if, they, if they have an inhaler at school and it's expired, um, then that's also um, probably can't be used as well. It's not gonna be as effective. So just ensuring that um, that inhaler that they bring to school, that reliever inhaler is um, not expired and um, communicating that with the parents to, to bring um, a, a good, um, a good um, inhaler uh, to use at school. Great, thanks for that reminder, Sarah. All right, we don't have any more questions in the Q&A. That takes us to the end of our presentation. And as I mentioned earlier, if you have any questions, feel free to either call our lung line or send them to info at lunghealth.ca and we will be happy to answer any questions that you may have regarding lung health. That includes back to school, asthma, and COVID. Thank you so much everyone for being here today. We really appreciate your questions, your interest, and uh, we look forward to providing you with more information and webinars in the future on important topics pertaining to lung health. Thank you.